welcome back. It's time again for another episode of WVU Marketing Communications Today. Brought to you by the good folks from West Virginia University. It's a show that sits squarely at the intersection of data-driven decision-making and modern marketing practices. With a rotating series of hosts, this week we're proud to have with us, uh, we're really pleased to have with us Matthew (laughs) Cummings, because I wasn't sure he was going to make it. They tell me it's snowing where you are. Uh, It is, yeah. Winter has arrived in our part of the country for sure, but uh, it's a delayed start to winter, but uh, yeah, you know. We're used to it. Will you send me a little picture? Because I spent so many years sitting here in Southern California. I don't remember winter. I, I, I sort of do. <laughs> Has some to do with white stuff long, falling out of the sky. That's all I remember. Yeah, I wish I had that problem. <laughs> so what's anyway. so what today? You're going to talk about something that's much more appealing than uh, being a snowbound here in uh, hot chocolate. You're going to talk about content marketing. Is smarter marketing? Is there such a thing? Absolutely, yeah. Our guest today is uh, Jennifer Chenault. She's an experienced B2B marketing professional at the intersection of healthcare and technology. Uh, Jennifer is a content marketing strategist for SOC Telemed, an acute telemedicine company in Reston, Virginia. It's probably a lot warmer down in Reston today. Uh, She considers herself a true marketing journey woman. Those are her words, having held direct response, lead generation, telemarketing, market research, product marketing, and product management roles in organizations of all sizes. And she blames this career path, right, on wanting to know everything about everything. When she's not writing or editing or distributing content at work, she's reading thrillers, science fiction, or fantasy, or working on her own fantasy trilogy. If we have time later, we'll have to talk about that. Jennifer is a WVU grad. She holds a degree in English from West Virginia University, and she actually met her husband in an elevator in our very own Summit Hall down on our downtown campus. Thanks so much for being with us this afternoon, Jennifer. Thank you so much for having me. I'm really, really excited to talk about content marketing. Listeners of this podcast are quite diverse, I will admit. So some are very experienced professionals uh, hoping to gain some insight and give them a competitive advantage. And others are maybe just getting into marketing communications or even unsure of uh, what path that they want to travel on. Let's level set here up top and, and share with us how you define content marketing and how it's different from what we traditionally think of as marketing or advertising. Great start. So content marketing is focused on creating and distributing valuable and relevant content to do a lot of things, attract, to educate, and retain a defined audience. And ultimately, its goal is to drive action. Now, that action could be reading more of your content, signing up for your blog, chatting up uh, you on the website, or even hopefully filling out a form asking for more information. This content can take many forms but it's written or created specifically for your buyer. It isn't about you. It's about them. Okay. You mentioned valuable and relevant content. Why would you say that content marketing then is so effective? I spent years writing features and benefits copy and creating brochures and catalogs, direct mail, emails, and the primary purpose was lead generation or sales. So it was all about my company and our products. Very little of it was really intended to educate anyone or provide thought leadership on the topic. The thought leadership, we thought it was built into the products, right? The difference with content marketing is that I'm helping prospects and customers solve problems by explaining, illustrating, showing, demonstrating, suggesting solutions. Not just our solutions, but being a trusted advisor who can help them understand how these type of solutions can solve their problems. So that's what we do and why we say it's smarter because the focus is on the buyer and not just talking about how great we are. And what we found is that buyers spend about 70% of their research time before they reach out to vendors or solutions. If you have great content that helps them with that research, they're going to be a lot more likely to look at you as a potential vendor. And they'll keep reading and viewing and interacting with your content throughout the buying cycle and afterward if you're giving them helpful guidance and advice that's relevant to them and their problems. How does an organization get started in content marketing? So just like any other marketing planning, you start with your audience. Who are they? What are their titles, Mm -hmm. educations, responsibilities? 
before there was ever a thing called a buyer persona, we used lists of likely buyers based on their subscriptions or their prior purchases. Those are just two data points we use now. We want to know their challenges, who else collaborates with them, who do they report to, where do they go for information. We create these buyer personas and start working on filling out our content planning to create assets, as we call them, you know, pieces mm -hmm. of content that help us educate them. Knowing how they research and consume information dictates the format. We don't just say, hey, we need a blog post explaining X, because maybe it's a video, maybe it's an infographic. In healthcare, there's definitely a bias among clinical folks to want to learn from other clinical folks. So right. we make sure that our content is authoritative in that respect. We use a lot of physicians and former hospital administrators to talk about what we do. So it sounds like really allowing the, uh, the end user to dictate the direction of the content and also the, the goals and the objectives that are set forth. Can you sort of walk us through in detail what that creative process looks like? Absolutely. It starts with the subject matter expert. And mm -hmm. that could be even a prospect that we're interviewing, but it could be an internal expert as well. So we start with them and we ask them to describe the challenges and explain the status quo for those buyer personas. Let me give you an example because it's probably a little easier to follow if I do that. One of the problems our buyer persona, which is a, an emergency department director in a hospital. So one of the things that they deal with is overcrowded emergency rooms. We start with why is that? Well, one of the reasons is there are a lot more patients visiting emergency rooms these days with mental health and substance abuse issues like five times more than there used to be, like even 10 years ago. And they take longer to treat because if there's a danger, if they're a danger to themselves or to others, a psychiatrist needs to be involved. And in many hospitals in the United States, there is no psychiatrist immediately available. Mm -hmm. They're probably in an office somewhere and they'll need to drive to the hospital and they're not going to do that in the middle of the night. Or they're busy working in the hospital's psychiatric ward and not available to go to the emergency department. So these patients wait and wait sometimes hours, and literally sometimes days. So we have the magnitude of the problem, and we can start focusing on potential solutions, and not just our solutions, but what kinds of things should hospitals be doing to solve this challenge? Do right. they need to create a separate area of the hospital for these patients while they wait? Do they try to hire a psychiatrist group that will come in 24-7? If we suggest using telepsychiatry as a way to solve this, we aren't talking about our telepsychiatry services, we're talking about telepsychiatry in general, and we back that up with how it works, how it can help alleviate crowded waiting rooms, the fact that patients look upon telepsychiatry pretty favorably, actually. We provide proof points and case studies about how it works, and then link those to evidence-based journal articles, so we have all of that brainstorming and research part of this process. And we don't provide a description of our services. That comes a lot later in the buyer's journey. So once we decide what we're going to discuss, then we go back to the preferences of the buyer to decide on the format. We'll put an outline together. We'll write. We'll get feedback. We'll revise. We'll design. We'll publish. A lot of rinse and repeating, really. Mm -hmm, and mm -hmm. that's not the only way this process works. Sometimes we hear from our account managers about specific questions that come up again and again. We'll add that to our list of content plans. Because if one customer has a question, undoubtedly others do too. And sure. our product folks are always researching in the field. Our product you know, development folks, they're always researching as well with our customers and with prospects to come up with new ideas, new functionality. And then we'll add them to content pieces that are a little later in the funnel, like checklists or, or comparison guides. They're intended for a little later in the journey. But that's, that's sort of the process that we go through. One thing that we do love around here is a quote from our CFO. And he says, it is easier to break an egg than make an egg. And well, we took that very, very seriously, and we put a first draft out there and let people beat it up and break that egg, and then we, we have something we could actually start working on. <laughs> that's great. And it sounds yeah. like it's a, it's a process that's informed at every step of the way and is as much as involved with listening uh, as it is writing and, and developing the content, right? Wow. Yeah, you said that really well. That's exactly yeah. what it's like. So let's step back and look at a, a plan. So say a, a listener here to the podcast today is interested in developing a content marketing plan. You walked us through that creative process for a campaign, but what about a plan for a brand or an organization? What are the key elements that should be included in a content marketing plan, at least a good one? That's a great question. The, the things that we try to do in a content marketing plan are just like you would in a normal marketing plan, but we have a few extra categories, right? So we start with our goals. 
of what we want to accomplish uh, as an organization that year in marketing and overall. And mm-hmm. then we, you know, so we, we know what, say, we want in lead generation and we want to know what website traffic we want to get or social media response or things like that. So we have our goals. And then we mapping out content that aligns with the buyer that we have in mind, the different okay. personas that we have in mind with those goals and with the stage in the buyer's journey, right? So it's sort of a, it's a 3D kind of model, right? There could be an emergency department director, for example, and we want to develop content that is in an, the awareness stage of that journey. So things like our blog, things like published articles that we, our PR team could put out. And then also put out content that's in the more of the consideration phase. So when they're looking at actual solutions, we can talk about sort of why this method or this way we do things is better and here's why kind of thing. And then on that decision uh, focus, there are things that are heavy hitting like comparison guides and ROI calculators, things Mm -hmm. like that, that people are really down deep and trying to come up with a solution and trying to pick a vendor and trying to decide between vendors, we want to stand out. And so those are the kind of pieces that we put together. So we have those things in mind and then we take the the year and the, and the month by month by month. And then we fill in things that are important events to us, trade shows. So things around trade shows, we have events such as international stroke week that we write content for. And we want to make sure that we are on the front of thought leadership in stroke because you know, we help people with and also mental health mm-hmm. awareness a month. We write content around that. And then there's always the opportunistic side too. And that doesn't really go in the plan as much, but you have to be flexible in the plan enough to, to be able to fit it in when something great or something happens. And then we put in this plan, you also need to have the element of sort of what you think the format will be for this piece, this idea that you have, but that mm-hmm. could change, right? But you, you start with at least an idea, you, you make the egg, and then you also want to know how you're going to distribute that content. So based on where your buyer is at, emergency room directors are way too busy, for example, to be on LinkedIn, way too busy, but they may uh, want to read something in their journal article that they get to right. once a month or once a, you know, so we need to be where they're at with the information that they need to understand, right? So, and then other buyers that we have in the hospital market, CFOs or a chief medical officer, they'll be in different places and we need to know where we're gonna distribute that content. Um, Social media, you know, LinkedIn, Twitter, those kind of uh, um, venues. We need to know where it's gonna go too. Some of it is Google advertising. We need a plan to understand you know, where all this content is going to fall through the year in Google advertising and display ads and, and those kind of things. So that's sort of the plan that we put together. We're a very small team. We try to put together some reasonable deadlines because sure. we know that's the toughest part, right? But that's how we put together our plan on a yearly basis for content marketing. And it sounds like it stays very flexible so that there is room for opportunities and to take advantage of opportunities maybe as they come up during the year and fit content for for those new challenges. Or maybe it's uh, something that that everyone is going to and the industry is going to be paying attention to. So we are actually going to take a quick break now. We're going to come back and talk a lot more about content marketing planning process and also measurement with Jennifer. So uh, hang tight. We'll be right back. And as always, we just want to remind you that this program is brought to you by West Virginia University's special online data marketing communications program, the only one of its kind in the country, the first graduate program in its field, focusing on strategic thinking, critical problem solving, and informed decision making. The data marketing communications program at West Virginia University prepares you for your career by learning those innovative tactics and strategies from award-winning faculty out in the field right now. You can learn more. Simply type in these nine letters, dmc.wvu.edu for the Data Marketing Communications Program at West Virginia University. And an extra spot this week to remind you that if you are interested, there are still tickets available to WVU's Integrate Conference, featuring the industry's leading marketing communications experts. It attracts attendees from across the country. You've heard the people that they talk each week on this show. That's the caliber of guests they're going to have there talking about all these topics at West Virginia University's Integrate Conference. And you have two chances to integrate this year, a one-day event in Washington, D.C., coming up quickly on March 31st and a two-day conference on the campus of West Virginia University 
perfect time of year to go there, May 29th through the 30th. Learn more at integrate.wvu.edu. That's integrate.wvu.edu. So they've expanded it to two events now here, Matt. Uh, it's not just one. They're going to do a one-day event in Washington at the end of this uh, next month and then a two-day conference like you did last year. Why Why the growth? So much demand here? Yeah, we've got to take it on the road, right? Not everyone can get to Morgantown uh, that time of year, and so uh, we got to take integrate out, out to the masses. All right. Uh, Washington, D.C. is definitely a great place uh, to do that. We have a lot of excitement around that event. Well, next year we need a West Coast version here. All right. Sounds good. We'll come out and visit you for sure, especially right. this time of year, right? Yeah, exactly. You know, I can't let this go, though. Uh, and Jennifer, I think you'll, you'll appreciate this, too. As a radio guy, Paul, you did get that number nine in that read, and that is a best practice in content marketing, right, Jennifer? <laughs> to, use, to use numbers in the headline. Yeah, uh, sorry. Definitely, oh, like yeah, that that's definitely of one of the tricks. See, you that know, because one of the tricks. So people well get overwhelmed by something, just odd put numbers, it in. Right? Yeah, odd numbers, too. Always odd numbers. Never, <laughs> never even numbers. She knows it. Yeah. I like if what it's odd, even you know, numbers? Calls, calls I, I, actually, uh, I actually don't believe in that rule, but I definitely think numbers give get grab people's attention for sure well you know the magic number i studied uh, I'll, I'll just throw this in for whatever it's worth since we brought it up here i studied screenwriting for years at ucla and uh, uc irvine here and in screenwriting they always talk about the magic of threes in mm, storytelling yeah. there are three pigs you, you get three wishes there's not by accident in sales it's good better and best you know you right, don't give exactly, them yeah. you don't give them five choices you don't give them one choice or even two <laughs> choices three's the magic number in storytelling and who wants to go with just good right yeah right exactly right I love it. speaking of numbers I, I want to jump right back into it here Jennifer but speaking mm -hmm. of numbers uh, you walked us through the creative process you also walked us through the elements that are in a content marketing plan let's talk a little bit about measurement how do you measure success in content marketing it sounds like a very qualitative approach but there's definitely a lot of data involved in this and, and how do you use data to see what's working Wonderful. That, that is absolutely a great question because that's the second question that any executive is ever going to ask me. So how do I know that this is working, right? So content marketing is about driving traffic to your website, converting that traffic into leads and those leads into sales. Simple rule of three, yeah. right? I just n named three things that we, <laughs> we are really looking at. So that's what we track. So I don't care as much about how many Twitter followers I have on my account yep. as to how many of them are going to the website based on what I posted, how many of those people filled out a form and became a lead, and then how many of those went to the end of the line and were a one deal. So we track those things. We are desperate for website traffic statistics, understanding where people go on our website, understanding when they convert, what page they're on when they convert, so we can do more of the things that work. So it is absolutely a qualitative exercise to put out good content, but the thing that I do every day is care about the sales number and care about the leads that come in and, and the people that are visiting us. That Those are the things that I measure. For sure. What are the top challenges? We've talked about all the great things and how you measure success, but what do you see as, as the challenges for content marketing as a focus in the marketing communication space and, and also for those of us that are just getting into this? Sure. So there are two big challenges in content marketing that everyone talks about. And the first one, of course, and most people identify just producing the content as the top challenge. We have turned to a lot of outsourcers to write blogs for us and case studies, which is appropriate. We're a small team. But I still have to manage those outsourcers, and I have to ruthlessly edit them, which takes time. I spend a lot of time educating freelancers on our market, our customers, and their challenges. And again, this is not features and benefits copy. This is much more nuanced and complex. So that's mm. number one, right? Now, most of the time, we can use the same content in multiple formats, so that helps with this challenge. We call that, simply enough, write it once, use it many. It's not rocket science, it's just common sense. Some people will respond to video, some to a blog, some to a podcast. I wrote a blog, it's just an example for you, called, and sorry, it has an even number, Eight Lessons Learned <laughs> After 650,000 Telemedicine Consults, which we've done more than that now, and I'll get to that. So we did a webinar on the same theme after I wrote the blog, and several of our experts went into a little more depth about what we do and how we do it. So it's a webinar, so people are expecting to be sort of sold to, so that's okay. And then we posted a recording of the webinar for people to download at their leisure. 
Then we created a flyer for a trade show uh, with a summary of the eight lessons. Then we updated the blog when we reached another consult milestone of 850,000 consults. And when we reach a million, you can bet I'm going to polish that blog off, I'm going to run it an update, and I'm going to probably do another webinar. So that's sort of a way you can deal with the fact that it takes a long time to produce content. The second big challenge is proving that content marketing is working to executive leadership. We've seen a huge increase in our website traffic in our marketing qualified leads since using content marketing. I've been at the company long enough to have done it the other way and then adopted content marketing as our strategy and then that's been about two years. So our social media accounts are growing, our blog subscribers are slowly but surely growing. Of course, it's hard to measure which exact piece or pieces of content were the trigger to becoming a lead. So that's something we're still working on. Narrowing that down is actually quite tough. And we do put calls to action in several spots on our website to try to capture more granular information, but that is still a challenge. I'm lucky enough to have an executive leadership team who is pleased with the growth in the website traffic, pleased with the growth in the leads, and pleased with the amount of money we're adding to that pipeline and closing in business. There's that business value of content right there. I love the write it once, use it many. It's uh, it's worth repeating. You said it once, I'm going to use it a few times in this podcast. <laughs> but good. Uh, definitely wrote that one down and underlined it. Obviously, you're writing about very complex topics in healthcare and technology. So, how do you? And you're not the you're not the SME on these. So, how do you find these nope. subject matter experts who can write? Well, that's really simple. We don't spend a lot of time looking for unicorns. So we interview them, we get their download out of their brains, right? And then we write it for them and give them final approval. So they get to break that egg. And this goes for both influencers in our field, you know, outside people and internal experts. It's a lot easier to get someone to help you if you don't make them stare at a blank page. Yep. Now, we do have some subject matter experts in house that can write. Uh, our chief medical officer writes his own blog and he's great and we are exploiting him for all he's worth. But there's another doctor who runs our ICU service line, the critical care service line. He loves to talk, but he is never going to put pen to paper. So <laughs> I, some days I think I should just follow him around and record him on my phone. Love it. You know, we've reached, uh, we've reached the end. I have time for just one more question and uh, kind of want to look forward here. And Jennifer, what do you see as the future of content marketing? That's a great question. There is a lot more science to content marketing than when I started. Many organizations and consultants are putting out content marketing about content marketing. So kind of meta, really. <laughs> as buyers are getting more sophisticated, they now know to look for good content to review during their research process and not just look at somebody's features and benefits on their website. We're seeing a big shift to high quality, substantive content rather than dozens and dozens of little things with all the same information or very shallow content. We're a small team with a small budget. So by necessity, we have to focus on doing a few things really, really well. My advice to your audience is to start with a blog and publish mm -hmm. it consistently on a timeline that works for your audience and then other, add the other content type slowly and keep your focus on relevance and quality. Great advice, great roadmap for producing quality content. Appreciate your insights here today, Jennifer. And thank you so much for, for spending time with us today. Oh, thank you for having me. It's my favorite subject. We appreciate it. And thank you for listening to WVU Marketing Communications today from West Virginia University. I hope you found today's episode as informative as I have. And until next time, take care. You've been listening to WVU Marketing Communications Today, brought to you live from West Virginia University, a bi-weekly program that sits at the intersection of data-driven decision-making and marketing practice, only on the Funnel Radio Network, for at-work listeners like you.